Uh, I'm just going to give this one last go. Um, there's not many people around. I apologise to Eric Weinbender. I had to end the other one. That's a bit of a problem with the connection. And um, as far as getting quick, but, uh, what will probably happen is I end up repeating everything I said there in that 10 minutes. So if you are going to watch this again, Eric, skip the first 10 minutes. Do yourself a favour. So I'm going to just give it um, about one and a half a minute or something like that. See if anyone pops up. And uh, then we'll just see where we go. It's uh, getting a bit darker now here. I'm trying to hit the right time for people when they come in and when they're going and in America and everywhere else. It's very difficult to get it exactly right. Uh, anyway. Whoever's here, please, if there is anyone, say something. I can see two people. One, I think, is me. Um, yeah, I'm just going to give it a little longer, and then we'll get started. Three people. Yeah, there's a box on the side. Hello. <laughs> Hooray. Someone's alive. <laughs> Uh, it's good to see you, Randy. Um, some of these records <laughs> are not going to be your thing necessarily, but some you might surprise me. There's a little bit of prog here and um, a bit of sort of obscure jazz, jazz fusion, that kind of thing. You probably uh, probably know all about it, really. You know. <laughs> um, first and foremost, I'm just going to show uh, a few people have been doing some percussion albums and I'm just going to show this. This is Thoreau and Aklaf, House of Spirit and Mirth. <laughs> By all means, you know, it's a free world and, uh, apparently and, um, you know, <laughs> it could be really dull for you. Uh, I was saying to someone the other day about it. And I said, the problem is I have, I have so many different things that I like and it's difficult to keep people interested to kind of worry all the time about it. And then he just said to me, he said, you're doing, you know, you're selling yourself short at the end of the day. If you have all those sorts of things, you know, you've got a diverse interest as far. So I thought, yeah, I'm going to go with it. It's a strength, not a weakness. Um, yeah, this is a percussion. It's a, a great little album. It's quite unusual. Bit avant garde, but this guy has some fantastic drumming on him. He uh, says here he studied with classical timpanist and, uh, and also the guy from the Funk Brothers and Motown band. He was absolutely brilliant. This is quite an obscure record originally. Hello, Peter, how are you? Um, it's worth a lot of money. One of those is probably 500 to 1,000 pounds, you know, silly amounts of money. This particular label, though, um, just sold jazz, and putting out some great reissues, and uh, this is one of them. I recommend it. It's a little bit unusual. You know, it's, it's, it's just percussion, and it's like, well, what's going on here? It's kind of a strange kind of wall of noise at times, and then but the playing is, is out of this world. I don't think recording quality is the best in the world, but it just kind of gives it an atmosphere. And uh, at the time, he was exploring the ideas of oneness and, you know, universality, you know, et cetera, et cetera, the kind of the common sort of new agey thing. Uh, I was saying in my last video, but let's face it, every time there's a drum solo on a record, especially on like a prog record or a psych record, we, we always wait, you know, we just, I just think, oh, shut up. Just, I want to get to the end. I want to hear the next track. I want to hear the bass and the guitar come back in. You know, drum solos, I said before, are great for people if they're, for drummers as they're playing them. But, you know, listening back, you know, once is enough. Very occasionally, though, you hear percussion. You want to hear it and you want to hear it. I think this is one of those case in point. It's not 
a boring drum solo. It's not like John Bonham going on and on and on. You know, great for five minutes. But, um, beyond that, <laughs> you know, all the Led Zeppelin nuts will be throwing things at the screen. <laughs> but hey, I'm right in that one. <laughs> All right, this is Moondog and Sun Cat Suites, Kenny Graham and his satellites. As the title suggests, Moondog, these pieces are based, the half of it is uh, Moondog's actual own pieces, uh, interpreted in, in a jazz kind of style. Now, I don't mean it a cheesy jazz, but um, because of Moondog's music, you know, so it's, it's out there, it's obscure, it's a bit like what's going on here at times. But at the same time, it just has a unique sound. I don't think anyone else sounds like Moondog. Uh, it's quite a rare album, this, in the UK. And it was reissued a few years ago on Trunk. But a great little record. And on side two, Sun Cat Suite, wittily titled, you know, because of Moondog. And they did their own songs and pieces in the style of and it works it, it's not an album which you know you listen to one side and think oh that's great and the second side doesn't work with side one it actually works all the way through it's a nice thing um yeah i'm just distracted there but every time i see the watches go up and down I think, oh, another one's gone you know i'm not like the omaha introvert or something it's like did a live thing and got how many people were just watching her stuff unbelievable um but yeah that's the problem isn't it <laughs> when you're not as popular uh, the show this i picked up a few weeks ago miles davis circle in the round this is uh, a compilation there you go another one goes this is a compilation, and um, but the title track is the thing to get. This is the same period as uh, Nefertiti and In a Silent Way, that particular track. It's got Tony Williams on it. Um, and it's a sidelong piece, and it's easily one of the best things he did. I mean, I don't know. It's just an amazing thing. The rest of the stuff on here is from, his, you know, from the 50s and 60s. One piece from 1970, it's a few from 1968, but uh, a nice little find, <laughs> interesting. And I recommend if you're into any kind of jazz at all. And I don't like a lot of jazz, I like some, you know, um, but that's my kind of jazz where it's a kind of intense sound for the entire side, and uh, people are really going for it. It's no holds barred, you know, not in a free jazz sense which can be kind of off-putting, but yeah, strong, strong musicianship, really good playing, good rhythm, good melody, great stuff. Yeah, I'm getting these few out of the way. Actually, maybe I'll leave that one. <laughs> um, this was a nice find as well. Uh, Gator Barbieri, Bolivia, 1973, RCA. This as well has got um, Lonnie Liston-Smith, John Abercrombie on guitar, Air 2 on percussion, some fantastic players, Stanley Clark on bass, fantastic. Now the good thing about it is he didn't, you know, he was leading the band and it was his material and um, he didn't say to them well you're doing this you're doing that and some some albums you know they've got these big jazz names but um the players can be a bit restrained or restricted by the music you know just going through the motions they might have a big name on it but it doesn't make it it doesn't mean that they're actually really necessarily adding much to the music but in this case it just seems like he was directing it uh kind of a latin fusion but very intense um not in a sort of cheesy you know salsa less Get your maracas out that. <laughs> that's a very intense sound kind of deep and intense great stuff as one or two lighter moments but um 
yeah, the intensity is what's good about this. But he allowed the players to kind of express themselves, and I think it comes through. He actually says on here, he wants to arrive at a point musically, uh, which he's able to express what's in him through the horn, as naturally as the act of walking and breathing. And he wants the music to flow instantaneously. It'll be so natural that other people will respond to it as naturally as it is made. And I think it is, it's one of those, you know, you, you do react to it and in a positive way. It's a strong, strong album. And 73. Okay. Now that you think, oh my goodness, where is he coming next? This is a Japanese cartoon from the 1980s. Mobile Suit Z Gundam. Now, why am I showing you this? It's got a couple of really cheesy tracks on it, the first track and the last track. Really, you know, it's like classic Japanese uh, cartoon intros and uh, outros. Really, really cheesy, corny vocals, just naff. But the rest of the album uh, is, a, is all electronic. Uh, it came with this huge post. I mean, <laughs> really strong electronic atmospheric music that's the uh, Japanese blur the guy who created this actually did a few electronic albums his first one is highly desirable uh, fantastic fantastic record you know it looks like I just picked it up because I mean I've had this a while now I picked it up because I thought well it's interesting it was one pound and it's in spotless condition. I thought I'll give it a go. And I was surprised by just how good it was. Absolutely fantastic. I mean, a lot, I've heard a lot of electronic albums. Um, but this is definitely up there, if you ignore the first and last tracks. Um, some great, great music on here. Completely unexpected. Not what you would expect by looking at the cover or by considering what the material is or what it would be about. Great music. The actual cartoon must have been quite atmospheric. Yeah. Now I'm going to show this album is shown all the time. I've shown it before. The reason why I'm showing is I'm just picking stuff off the shelf. Um, this is an original, and. Inside, someone had drawn their own rock bottom. Let's see if I can put some light on this. They've drawn their own ship. And I quite like that kind of thing. He's not drawn all over the sleeve, which is very kind of him. And he's also written on the back here. He's put all the times of the, the uh, songs. But actually, there's a few things in this collection which had his writing on He's sort of waxing lyrical about, um, there's a Frank Zappa album I've got, and he's just waxing lyrical about Frank and uh, the work he did on the album, how great it was. And you can tell the guy is completely out of his face. <laughs> he's actually said something in one of them about being out of his face at the time. See, there's, a, there's another thing here. Uh, on the back, he's written, every time life laughs, it laughs at me. And all I can do is feel the fuff. <laughs> That's as far as he got. <laughs> And as I walked along the littered pavement, I realised what Hallington Muse meant to myself and the other doomed residents. A fine, distinctive residential settlement. We pioneers in a barren, corrupt and fallen world, dealing with, as missionaries will, the dregs of... That's as far as he got. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, for some reason, he's named his ship HMS Grope. I have no idea why. <laughs> But yeah, I like that kind of thing. Interesting, very interesting. The guy was obviously, maybe he was just dreaming. There's, there's some note on one of his records about sitting 
uh, at his first floor window looking out and writing this stuff, you know, out of his face while the music's playing and uh, not being too distracted by Zap around the line. Uh, anyway, I found a copy of this yesterday. This is from Move, a message from the country. On Harvest, 1971. Now this actually, you know, it has a little bit of value to it. I've never, I've never been a fan of the Move. You know, the, some of the 60s stuff I liked, but Roy Wood is a, you know, just gets on my nerves. I don't really like the way he plays. I don't like the music, really. Some of Wizard, I quite like that stuff. But um, this actually has a bit more about it. It's, you know, it's quite, what's the word? It's kind of dark in places. You know, it's, it's quite kind of dense sounding. And this, I think some of the problems with uh, records for me is uh, they're just not one thing or another, you know, they're, they're a bit patchy. This actually is consistent all the way through. It's not a five-star album by any means, but it's probably, it's because it's not psych, it's probably their best of the rest, if you like. Most people will hold up the move for the first couple of albums for Shazam, etc. But this is actually a very good album, solid. And you can see, you know, where Jeff Lynne and Bev Bevan were going. You know, they had that in them, that kind of anthemic, kind of big prog sound, which was in them. Yeah, if I come across Move albums at all, this is the first time I've seen this. If I come across them at all, it's always cheap compilations of their 60s singles. Um, you, I see that all the time, it's Move comp. But very rarely come across their albums. Their actual studio albums. Very hard to find. But good stuff. And uh, it's worth checking out. But you, you do need to kind of almost sit back and listen to the whole thing. The whole thing, thing has got a bit of a feel and a theme to it, really. Uh, it's nice for. This thing actually is drawn and uh, painted by Roy Wood. And it does say everything on here is Roy Wood and Jeff Lynn. It's all uh, oh, it's a track written by Beth Bev. But everything is very, very specific. You can tell that there are problems, you know, creeping in because you've got the vocals listed Jeff Lynn. Next one says vocal Roy Wood. Then you've got vocal Jeff Lynn and Roy Wood. It's a bit like Deep Purple Storm Ringer, where suddenly, oh, and Burn, where Glenn Hughes and David Coverdale had their songs separated and because, because of the issues between them. And you can see it's all creeping in here. But anyway, nice thing. <clears throat> I found a very nice copy of... Uh, oof, five or six, I believe. Because uh, they went into Wizard after that. Uh, 1973 or 72. So that's 71 and maybe five. Um, Eat a Peach, of course. A uh, very nice copy of it. I had this years ago and got rid of it. I purged it and um, I just sort of found another copy and thought, well, I'm going to try it again. <laughs> I'm going to say it and I say this a lot. It's... <sighs> I don't really like a lot of it. So, you know, the Mountain Jam things are really good. A couple of the pieces on here, the Le Les Brer in A minor, or Les Brer in A minor, it just sounds kind of poor, poorly improvised, you know, like they don't really know where they're going, they don't really know where they're going, that's what it seems like to me, it just doesn't really do it for me. Some of the musicianship, of course, is excellent, but um, yeah, it's not, uh, again, it's, it's not uh, like live at film or something. I like some of it, but I don't really like all of it. I don't know what anyone else thinks. It's okay. There you go. <laughs> it's a good job probably I have so few people watching this at the minute because I can't hear all sorts of people going, I'm sorry, mate, you are wrong. You are so wrong. <laughs> yeah, what can you do? 
Um, I'm going to show a couple of this caravan. I've had this for years and years and years. Girls who grow plump in the night. Great title. They always had their witty titles. Um, it's been shown a number of times, of course. I just thought I'd show it along with a few other bits of prog today. Hello, Michael. Um, yeah, this, I don't really like this album. <laughs> it's, it's all right. You know, I just think when they hit, they lost members, they changed members. And uh, it just isn't the same. It doesn't have the same feel to me. One or two of the pieces, the first track is good. The dog, the dog he's at it again, has that kind of slightly quirky wit, you know. And uh, the instrumental Cthulhu, that's that's okay. But it's a little bit 1973. Yeah. yeah. And 1973 to me has a sort of crossover sound where it's a little bit cheesier. Yeah, the Hammond organ, the kind of steaming Hammond organ was being replaced by a kind of different kind of keyboard. You've got uh, a Davily synthesizer on here, which is interesting, a little bit different. But it just, you know, again, <laughs> I think when people talk about Caravan, they talk about the first two or three albums. And then after that, I think Waterloo Lily onwards, I think people kind of lose interest a bit. And I, you know, it's, I think it's understandable. The best quality in the first three, definitely. They don't have the same sort of. I suppose it's just for different musicians, and I think because of it, it just has a different feel. It just doesn't really sit as well. It's almost like a different band. And in my opinion, and it's just an opinion, a slightly an inferior one. <clears throat> I am going to show this, our first album. I think I may have shown this in my maybe my second ever, the reason I'm showing some of these one or two things pop up again here and there is because obviously a lot more people watch these things nowadays and know me to when I first started. This is fully signed, including Jimmy Hastings. So all five of them, saw them at a gig and uh, this is where I got it signed back in the early 90s. I kind of did a, rip, a small gig in the in a school, a friend of ours was a headmaster, and they decided to kind of reform, I say reform, almost reform, just play back all their old stuff. And uh, they kind of, that's kind of where they kick started their 90s kind of career and their comeback, and the people started getting more interested in them again. This is not for the original cover, this is a 1972 reissue. But a very nice thing, and of course, uh, Richard Cobbleton there is dead now. It's nice to have all of these. Richard Sinclair typically with his little music, a lot more flamboyant than the rest of them. Yeah, lovely stuff. And programming because it's all psych. It's a high quality psych album. Where but for Caravan would I, or would I be, it says here. Where but for Caravan would I is uh, the title. Fantastic, fantastic heavy psych. Place on my own ride for me, is the best track on here. The way that the vocals follow the acoustic guitar line, uh, beautiful stuff. And the, oh, that melody is wonderful. Cecil runs, of course, with uh, Complete Sight, Grandma's Lawn, Magic Man as well. This is a lovely sight record. And maybe doesn't get kind of the same love because of, there's a lot of US sight, which is great. But it amongst for UK sight people so much because um, Caravan is seen as a prog band, and it's a very rare, hard to find album. And maybe it gets overlooked as a psych album, but it's a great, great record. It probably sits, some of these tracks sit alongside uh, the family album, Music in the Doll's House. Sort of, in my mind, anyway, I have a similar kind of feel. <clears throat> I'll show two or three more. This is a uh, Quite an interesting compilation, Dimensions in Miracles. You know, there's a lot of Vertigo and Ireland and different samplers at the time. This actually has some great stuff on here. You've got Ancient Greece, which of course a lot of people will know. 
women and children first I've put on here. And what I love about those compilations, they didn't sort of skimp finger or put a three minute song and a four minute song. You know, they, if it was an eight minute song, they put an eight minute song because it's the best one. And women and children first is probably the killer cut from that album. And I'm a King by Broth. Now Broth is a fantastic uh, kind of psych prog album. Very difficult to find. It has been reissued, like everything has been reissued over the last few years. Uh, really good, really strong album, that one. It's also got J.D. Blackfoot, The Ultimate Prophecy on here. So it shows you the quality. Blue Cheer, Buddy Miles is on here. It shows you the quality of uh, the compilation. Very strong and probably quite cheap to get. Really good. Now, I'll show a couple more before I hit the road. This is a very easy thing. Ah, hello, Sheriff. That's <laughs> just as I was thinking, oh, uh, I'll probably knock it on the head soon. However, I have kept a couple of the uh, fusion y type albums back, so I'll, <laughs> um, I'll show some of those because I've shown some of the fusion and jazz. Okay, yeah, this is the Edgar Broughton band. It's just a compilation of a bunch of 45s and that's probably where they were strongest actually is on their 45s i mean they were really really good they didn't mess around this were they were a power trio they were really strong although saying that they actually added another guitarist and um, became stronger even but some of our songs are really quite you know witty very political they were a very political band they did a lot of the free festivals and free gigs and very sort of socialist. In fact, I think I know one of them became a social worker uh, for a period in the 70s and maybe into the 80s. Uh, I'm not sure if they still are, because obviously uh, they reformed and did some gigs and stuff. But fantastic songs on here. You've got Apache Dropout, which is probably the most famous with the Beef Art song called Shadows and Beef Art Mix. And actually confused, I think, you know, he sounds a bit like Captain Beef Art. And the first album, especially for Lee Singer. Um, Mama's Reward, Keep Them Freaks Are Rolling, I mean, just heavy and intense. But at the same time, they can do tracks like Hotel Room and Someone, which have you know, a kind of fragility and a beauty to them. But nothing kind of sits out of place next to each other. They did five albums. Uh, yeah, there's a period of five albums before they did a couple of mid 70s kind of doubles, if you like. And you could listen to them from start to finish. And there's a really good flow. It's not like there's a big difference between them. The first one is very, very heavy. Incredibly heavy album for 1969. Perhaps the heaviest. It's heavier than heavy metal, you know. It's so heavy. And then um, they kind of mellowed things out a bit. But those next four albums all sit very nicely together. It's not like there's a huge progression in sound. But they got a sound and they, they nailed it absolutely perfectly and their singles are just superb because a lot of the singles they weren't on lp which is even better so you get you know so much more to choose from if you're into a band and they're releasing singles that aren't on vine aren't on the lp which was quite common at that time well, it was becoming common anyway uh, here's the soft machine turns on this is for strange fruit peel sessions from about 1990 this was released. And of course, it has the very famous, uh, yes it is, yes it is. It has the very famous Moon in June, rewritten by Robert White while he's sitting in the studio. And uh, he changed all the words and just, I mean, just sat there apparently and just, just penned them all through. And it just sounds fantastic. It's so clever, so funny. Um, and the way he merged the chorus into his original song, fantastic. And this has facelift. And you hear Soft Machine and their absolute best here. This is with slightly more jazz. So obviously, Kevin Ayers wasn't here at this time. You had Elton Dean and Hugh Hopper. But this, I mean, just hearing them playing it, laying it down live, great, really great high quality all the way through 
Hugh Hopper's material is really some of the best on here. His bass playing is uh, is absolutely stunning. Hello, how are you doing, Paul? It's good to see you. Yeah, this is this is very good, very good indeed. I mean, you know, you've got if this does kind of go into Soft Machine Four territory, where you um, you know you've got a little bit more of the jazz and you know, yeah, the, the jazz side of things. Um, I'm kind of sort of going over oh, jazz. <laughs> I think as I'm saying that because I know that a lot of people don't rate Soft Machine for uh, fourth. Now and I can understand that after third, it'd be a difficult thing to follow up. Yeah, it's a shame that it's like, you know, through the middle of the night here. Sometimes when I wake up, I actually, you know, I try and watch an hour so I didn't get, I didn't wake up in the night. And when I did wake up in the night, about five o'clock, it was too late. But um, yeah. So let's say Soft Machine 4, people kind of don't always rate. I think there's some good stuff on it. Teeth, the first track particularly. Um, great album, but very good band. Very good. But you can hear the influence of... Uh, what's the album? If you want that Coleman Free jazz album, there's a, there's a piece lifted clean out of it when you see it as a live thing they did in the Paradiso and... Uh, of a Royal Albert Hall, it's just a piece lifted out. I didn't actually say it was his. Oh, you like most of them, that's good. Yeah, I think for one or two, I still I can't remember. I did have fifth and sixth, I don't know what I did with them. I don't know why I haven't got them anymore. <laughs> I've got Softs and um, the live one, live in Paris. But yeah, that's where to go. Yeah, that's the best best period really. Well we have the later band again it's a different band so as a result they don't really sound the same. You have to kind of do that with a lot of bands and you have to kind of think okay you know I'm going with the flow here this is a different band and uh, otherwise you can kind of start to frown upon them. <laughs> Just not as good. A different beast entirely but this highly recommended. If you like the first if you like three and four you really like this. Yeah, Live in Paris is excellent. You'll really like this. The sound on this, I mean, just the quality is a BBC recording. A BBC recording. This is uh, fantastic from the Peel Sessions. John Peel, of course. Now, if you want to go back a little bit, Sherv, later, I've shown things like this. You might want to have a look at that. <laughs> and what else did I have? Uh, this is an interesting... I'm going... I'm swinging <laughs> all over the place. This is an interesting record. Klaus Lenz, Jazz and Rock Machine. It says it all down the bottom. Again, this is, uh, I think it was 1979. This actually is a really strong record. Now, there's a couple of slightly weaker moments. There's a slightly, slightly big bad sound at times in a couple of points. But again, what I like is when you hear fusion, which is a real blend of the rock and the jazz. And this works well on this really does work well. It's quite strong in places. The first track, Fusion, is excellent. The spring song is really good. And you've also got um, Narislovsky on here. Very famous. He pops up all over the place in Fusion records. I don't think out of the others there's any Hans Hartmann. I've recognised his name. I'm not sure there's anyone else who anyone else would recognise that. If you see that. Uh, great little record though. Fairly easy to get. And uh, quite a strong sound again. It's sort of in line with the soft machine-ish. But, you know, it's later, it's heavier. Yeah, definitely heavier in places. Great album though. Not sure if anyone's seen it before, but yeah, it's a nice thing. And I'm just going to show one or two more. Now this is completely different. This is a very 
This is music for the silences to come by Dan Abra. I'm calling him Bra. Maybe Bra. I don't know quite how to pronounce that. I'm assuming it's Bra. And uh, this is a fantastic record. Here he is on the boat. It does say he did play with uh, Malicorn, Fairport Convention. Uh, he began playing with Alan Stivell's Celtic Rock Group. You know, he did the Renaissance harp, uh, the Celtic harp album. This has got some quality, quality stuff. Sister, yes, it does, it does. I've got it actually, it's next to a couple of George Winston's on the shelf. Um, this is quality. Now, it does, has a slightly 80s sound in a couple of, you know, on the production. But the music on here is, is quite beautiful, actually, really quite beautiful. But because I mean, he's such a good player, he really is a really incredible player. You could imagine him, you know, playing for King Crimson or something. He's that technically gifted. Yeah. Absolutely fantastic. It's just got a good feel. It's only a cheap thing. And it's on Shenaki. Nineteen eighty-six. Yeah, nineteen eighty-six. Uh, nice long pieces. You know, two pieces on each side, four minutes, two on two six minutes. It's a really nice little record that. And it's not the sort of thing. You know, I mean, some people will say, "Well, it's a bit too gentle for me. I need a bit of." You know, I don't know. It's, it's difficult to define. It's got a bit of everything about it. There's something about it. As soon as you put it on kind of just it sort of elevates the mood and it takes you somewhere and it's a it's a lovely feel to it exceptional quality really strong yeah there you go uh, Brian music for the silence is to come I uh, probably will leave it there um, because I see the lights coming again I you know I was going to show a bunch of 45s now <laughs> I know not a lot of people like 45s. I always in my live videos show a bunch of 45. So maybe I'll just pull a few out. It's, the light gets bad at this time of year. I'll just pull a few out. This is uh, because I like 45s. I'm not sure. Most people don't seem to collect them. I know Randy does. This is I Don't Need No Doctor. Uh, Ray Charles. This is actually incredibly hard to find over here. It's probably 70 or 80 pounds worth and that's ripped sleeve. <laughs> Easily replaceable. I get my act together and just change it. A uh, fantastic song, probably for me his best song. It's such a groove, it's such a good feel. It, I mean, it's just brilliant. That's absolutely fantastic. I do like the version on the Whale Feathers album, but I love that version. But this, probably the best version I've heard. Fantastic song, really good. You know, please say you're fooling on the other side of me. Who cares? A lot of Ray Charles I could take or leave, but um, this kind of thing where it's, it crosses over into the Northern Soul, and that's what that is really. It's a Northern Soul version of it, and uh, just love that sound. This is actually a soul box, or that about. So um, this is a great song. The Sand Pebbles, Love Power on track. The track never did picture sleeve sings, those uh, covers, they always had one. But the vocals on that, Love Power, it's one of those. That, um, yeah, I see a lot of his LPs. This is, for me, it's, it's I kind of end, if I'm playing a lot of soul singles, I'll end on this because it's all maybe a different box. Yeah, well, I'll end on this track because I just don't know where to go afterwards. The, the song is so good. The vocalist is love power, is it? I mean, she is powerful. So uplifting and so kind of deep, wonderful production on this as well. Deep, loud, wonderful. This is a bit different. Uh, the roulettes. Completely the wrong bag on parlophone. 
I hope he breaks your heart. This is a demo. And find out the truth. Very difficult thing to find. Hello again, Rob. You've come in just near the end, I'm afraid. I've gone 40 minutes. I've got 40 minutes? Anyway, I hope you praise your heart. Another great song. If you don't know that, check that one out. Nice little tune, that one. Huh? I do love that kind of 60 sound. 1965. Great, great stuff. Here's a nice one. This is uh, another demo by the Chiffons. Stateside, my boyfriend's back. And I got plenty of nothing. And what a great song that is, my boyfriend's back. This for me is the best version of it. Just a great little song. And then these songs are just so catchy. I mean, <laughs> once I start playing these songs, it's less difficult to play anything else. They're just so catchy. And you want to play one after another after another. And that is a great one. My boyfriend's back. And then what you can do in two minutes. Phenomenal. Here's another. This is on. Um, this is a bit of honey. Living made. And uh, he's for one. Another really superb little single. Strong vocals again. Really powerful. So catchy. I keep saying the same words because it's, kind of <laughs> it's difficult to know what else to say about them. They're just so good. I'm just running through. I'm not giving history or anything of this stuff. I don't tend to do that. Here's another nice one. Uh, this guy, I try and find all his records. Very difficult to come by. He's so fine as an with Yes. Come On, Let's Go by Wayne Gibson. He did that fantastic Under My Fun. Uh, and this is Wayne Gibson and the Dynamic Sounds. The other B sides, the dynamic sounds pop for whip, kind of instrumental. But this again, um, I'm sure if you uh, are not sure if Randy collects this kind of thing, these are great, great songs. It's sort of like a, it's not mod, but it's uh, kind of it's a beat single. 1964, come on, let's go. Yeah, it's pure beat. It's a beat record, and it's a great one. Hard to find though. This is Mia Lewis, Nothing Lasts Forever, never officially released, uh, Baby I'm Feeling Good, I think, I'm not sure if it's on YouTube or not, but another great, great single, it's so catchy, this is a 60s girl band, you know, 60s girl pop, lovely little girly vocal and, uh, and uh, just a lovely sentiment to the song, Nothing Lasts Forever, it sounds kind of negative, but it's not, it's just it's a lovely little tune. And I'm just racing through here. Yeah. Oh yeah, this was the other one, of course, I think. If I end the night on anything, stay with me, Lorraine Ellison. Showing it before. I've got my baby back on the B-side. Easily one of the greatest vocal performances of all time. Incredible. You know, it's, it's up there with the vocal performance. There's Doris Troy on them. Um, Dutch boy on oh, dark side of the moon. It's one of those. It's breathtaking, breathtaking, heartfelt, emotive, absolute quality. I'm sure you all know that song. This is a uh, another northern soul. This is a version of Fever, You Give Me Fever, by Helen Shapiro, another difficult single, single to find. The other, the other side is like whatever, but the Northern Soul crowd, this is what I want. And again, it's got that Northern Soul sound, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful, timeless number. And, you know, you know the song, You Give Me Fever, um, and you think, oh, you know, I've heard it, I've heard it. You haven't heard it. <laughs> this is how to hear it. This is how to hear it. You know, it's a lot of songs you hear, you, know, well, you hear them on the radio, you hear stuff, even whatever. But actually, when you, you hear these versions, they just kind of elevate them to another place. It's just, the song itself just is so different. 
it's not like the same ones that it was here all the time. That's just a great version of it and see why it's so desirable. This is a nice one. Yeah, yeah, it probably is along with yesterday and things like that. But that is definitely a great version, Helen Shapiro. This is a nice little thing, 1966, Billy Fury. Now, obviously, Mr. Rock and Roll, but he changed and he went into a sort of beat and sort of garagey sort of selection. Yeah, she did do a few nice little songs. Gets overlooked because she was pop, you know, and... Uh... <laughs> yeah, that's right. Hey, Joe, flip that, yeah. Um, she's so far out, she's in. This is classic 60s beat. It's like a mod tune, mod beat. Lovely thing. Billy Fury. You know, you wouldn't think, you'd naturally think he was rock and roll and he kind of faded away, but he did have some fantastic singles in the 60s. This is one of them. She's so far out, she's in. You know, this is a classic 60s thing, too, being far out now. Wonderful. I'll just I'll show a couple more because you know, this could go on forever. This is, oh, you might see this is on Spark, Sign on the Dotted Line by Gene Latter. Now, he's another one. I collect all this stuff if I can find it. Uh, he's on, is it Rubble? Or he may be on the Rubble comps. Um, yeah, he did. What's the song on there? cover version of a Rolling Stone song escaping my mind Gene Latter uh, oh yeah fantastic I, I haven't heard a bad song by this guy he kind of disappeared in about 1970 and 71 no one really knows what happened to him but wow it never did a bad song both of these I love you and uh, sign on the dotted line great great single so catchy and I love, I mean, it's just something about 45s, you know, that you play them. For me, I, in some ways, I prefer them. Because, I mean, there's a lot of 45s just, you know, whatever, throwaway pop stuff, you know, we've all heard it. Mid 70s sort of junk and that. But, you know, when you get a good single, there's just nothing quite like pulling out a box of 45s and uh, just spinning them one after the other. I find myself doing that probably more often than I do with the uh, LPs. It's because I kind of like, you know, you want to play a track, you want to play another, you want to play another. But with LPs, it's difficult to actually sit these days and actually listen to an LP. Because I keep finding I want to hear more, I want to hear more. Maybe to show one more. There are a couple. Here's Howling Wolf EP. That's a very nice little thing. Yeah. Exactly. That's what I like about it. This is... Uh, like a miniaturized version of his album, of course, with the chair, smokestack lightning, howling for my baby, going down slow, you'll be mine. On Pi, R&B series. It even has the original five shillings price ticket. It's not something you see every day. Yeah, it's a nice one. And I do like EPs, but EPs, is just, they didn't sell hardly any in the 60s EPs. I mean, they were just, apart from the Beatles and stuff, um, just very hard to find EPs, especially good good condition, good quality, and stuff like this. Very hard to come by. Yeah, like this is a good example. Um, this is John Lee Hooker down at the landing. Now, again, a very rare chess EP. Haven't got the sleeve. Just happened to be in the same box. But down at the landing, that's quite a rare EP, that one. And there's some good, good tracks on here. Down at the landing, uh, Women and Money, Union Station Blues, and Leave My Wife Alone. Never ever seen the sleeve in the wild, and obviously, you see pictures of it anytime you like. But yeah, that's a nice one. 
But John Lee Hooker again, to find an EP of John Lee Hooker. That's the only time I've ever seen one. Yeah, which of course, I'm talking about in the wild, I'm talking about in the charity shops and stuff like that. A lot of his stuff is charity shop stuff down the years. Most of it not brought online or brought in the uh, record shops. Uh, I'll show a couple more. This is Jimmy James and the Vagabonds. Ain't love good, ain't love proud. And don't know what I'm going to do. Piccadilly. And pie. Piccadilly. That's another nice one. I'm sure you all know Jimmy James. What else we got here? Oh, I do like this one. Oh, I do like this one. This is a theme for Five Fingers of Death. Going a little bit more funk here. Bunny Sigler. It's a great one. Regina on the B side. Five Fingers of Death. The classic kind of black exploitation uh, track, that one. Soundtrack. Great stuff. <laughs> This is a very common single, but I don't know what it's doing in the soul box. We've got The Who. I just want to show it because I like that label. Happy Jack. And I've been away on Reaction. Just love that. They're very common over here, these ones, of course. I see them quite often. Maybe finish off from there. We're going to go nice and uh, this particular woman, Sharon Grimmond, put a, obviously left a collection in the charity shop about five or six years ago, and they were all fantastic, absolutely killer singles. This is um, Sandy Posey's single girl. I just love that song. Yes, I'm sorry, I held up my hand. I just think it's a lovely little song, and this is a demo with Blue is My Best Colour on the B-side, on MGM. I just think that's a lovely little song. I don't do country, and not at all. We have a few things here and there. Um, but this, I just something about it. it. Does something to me. Anyway, I'll leave it at that, because the light is appalling again. And I know that this is probably kind of a bit blurry, which it wasn't earlier. Um, so thanks a lot, guys, for popping in and uh, stopping by for so long for those of you who made it to this point. I suppose I'll see you all later and uh, yeah it's good to see you. Um, have fun and uh, can't wait to see some more videos from you all, those of you who make videos right? and uh, enjoy yourselves. I'll see you later.